So this is, anybody recognize this? Where is that? Santa Rosa Island, right, our research station on Santa Rosa Island. Santa Rosa is one of the reasons that we started working on sandy beaches here at CSUCI. So we moved into that research station starting about five years or so ago. And we, we try to add to capacity. And so we were trying to figure out what we could help monitor out on the Channel Islands that folks aren't, aren't currently monitoring or aren't monitoring intensely. And the short answer was sandy beaches. So Santa Rosa Island is over enriched with sandy beaches relative to the other northern Channel Islands. So if you just looked at the, the basic geomorphology, compared it to its, its fellow islands, you would say, you would predict that there would be less extensive sandy beaches out there um, than we otherwise would expect. So it's on the order of about 60% of all the sandy beaches in the northern Channel Islands are found on Santa Rosa Island. So they're, they're more abundant and, and when they, places where they are in existence, they're wider than we might typically think. So that appears to be our working hypothesis is that that's because we've massively nuked the vegetation out there. So by stocking non-native ungulates for the last gazillion decades, we've overgrazed and so we're leading to greater soil erosion than we would um, otherwise expect. And so now that we've removed, as of a few years ago, we've removed the large um, non-native ungulates like deer, non-native ungulates like tule elk, now that we've removed those guys, the, the vegetative community is starting to, to grow back, the grass is starting to get more abundant, the shrubs are starting to get taller, and retaining sediment on the landscape, so as a consequence there's less sediment going to the watersheds, less sediment to the watersheds, less sediment onto the beaches. So this is a perfect long-term project for, for us here at Channel Islands because you know we go out there and monitor every year, some of your classes go out and monitor, and over you know, 5, 10, 20 years we'll get a picture of the changing dynamic of this important component of the landscape and get an, get an insight into how the management, how our, how our actions on land are influencing this zone at the interface of the land and the water. So the general operating principle, so we started out on Santa Rosa Island, started monitoring there and then we added on the mainland and then we've sort of been going gangbusters ever since. Our central thesis of just about all of our work here on sandy beaches is that be beaches are almost like the ideal partner, right? So they're, they got a lot of money, and I know Dr. Patch has talked to you guys about valuation, right? We're in the, in the tens of billions of dollars, 62 billion, it depends on how we want to measure it, but, but tens of billions of dollars each year generated by these sandy beaches here in the state of California. But they're also a cheap date. So we don't, need, we don't need to take them out to steak. We don't need to do anything fancy, right? Very cheap date. And so um, we were there. We loved the beaches when we were laying out our towels and going surfing and, and, and playing volleyball and all that or watching the sunset. But when we leave the sandy beaches, we tend to completely ignore them. So we get a lot of economic, a lot of social benefits. We don't put a lot um, directly into managing and, and maintaining the health of these beaches. So I suspect that's something Dr. Patch has already hit upon. Yeah? No? Yes? Everybody's catatonic after lunch or something? That's what's going on. No? Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. All right. So, so we felt that um, this is a fantastic research project. One, it's a perfect thing for you guys to be working on, and it's a perfect thing for us to be working on, and it's something that we can um, leverage our skills to make an impact in terms of improving the management, improving access, improving the management, improving the understanding, all of that kind of stuff. That's our main thesis. Again, uh, you've heard about this and heard about and will continue to hear about in this class, but clearly the ocean and in particular the sandy beach has a disproportionate effect on our culture relative to the aerial extent, re relative to the amount of area that is within sandy beach. It's very important to our identity, um, our, our stories we tell about ourselves, how we dress, what we do, and um, and we see that over and over again. And we see that in terms of how we like to portray ourselves to the wider society. And indeed, that portrayal has become so important, not just these, these beach movies in the 60s, but this, anybody know where this is right here on the upper right? Any guesses as to where this is? Not, it's Ventura County, yes. It's Point Magoo. It's where the Navy base is now. And so this was the number one place to film films in the silent film era that had anything to do with the beach or whatever. So, 
So th this you see in the, in the background, you guys thought maybe that was Ventura because it looked like there's a pier there. There was a pier there until 1923 when a hurricane came and took out the pier. Um, but, but all these people in the beach, th these are all part of a film crew making a film. And so people would go there very close to Hollywood. You could plant a palm tree, make a look at the South Pacific. You could, you could you know, tweak, do whatever you want. And so it was a very um, a tractable landscape to do stuff. So not only do we, do we take culture from the beach, but actually we, we imprint our ideas of what a beach should be frequently on our beaches here. Not knowing how much Dr. Patch has already covered, I just wanted to do a, a quick and dirty here before we got into uh, much of this. But suffice it to say, um, there are many stressors, many things that are uh, causing potential challenges, real challenges or potential challenges to our Sandy Beach ecosystem. And some of those uh, are listed here. Things like hardening infrastructure, things like the area surrounding the beach becoming urbanized and more concrete and more impervious and, uh, and influencing how, not, not just how uh, material is fixed, but also how material moves across the landscape. So how sediment um, f goes from the, sh say, your street to the creek and the creek to the beach. Ease of access is a huge thing. So you guys, uh, anybody here from outside of California? Oh, cool. North Carolina. Texas. Texas. So you guys have very different rules. So my North Carolina, so, so, so yeah, so what do you get when you guys think of the beach? Do you think of just going to the beach any old time, any old place? Summer. Summer? Yeah, I guess summer. I would go to New Jersey. I go to New Jersey, right, exactly. Um, yeah, summer So when I think of North Carolina, I first went there, uh, a friend of mine is a, a, a kind of rock and roll guy, and uh, so he was having a wedding. So we went to the wedding, and before the wedding, we went to the, the um, not bachelor party, but what we, like the, like the pre-wedding party. And we went to his in-laws, and his in-laws had a house on the, 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 the coastal strand right there on the beach. And we're sitting there, and the house, it, again, most of the country is very flat, right? Very shallow coast. We in California have very much an up-down, new, geologically young coast. So when we stand on the edge of, of the beach, or say on PCH and take a rock and chuck it as high as we can, right? A little, little small rock, it's gonna go up, plunk, hit the water, and maybe it sinks in, who knows, 70 feet of water, 100 feet of water, something like that, right? If we did the same thing in North Carolina, say, we'd throw it as hard as we can go, plunk, and it would go down, I don't know, two feet, three feet, right? It's a very shallow shelf there. So I go to this, go to this uh, uh, thing and I'm looking and there's waves rolling and then the house is not 20 feet up a cliff. The house is about two feet above the high tide line. And I'm trying to figure this out. And, and the other thing is there's fences that go from the house down into the water. And I'm saying, well, how do you walk across the beach? And the says, oh, you don't walk across the beach because we own the beach. So the notion of public access that you guys might experience, we just go to any old beach, as long as it's not a nuclear plant or a military plant, right? Just go to any old beach and can access it. That's in the California Constitution, this coastal access issue. That doesn't exist in many other parts of the world. Is that even in, like, with those, like, coastal Uh-huh. Those are still public beaches? Absolutely. Like so the Coastal Act was created because of two things, yeah. Sea Ranch up north and Malibu down here. So Malibu freaked out, and Sea Ranch freaked out people. And, and, and wealthy folks started accumulating property and started sealing it off. And so we, I guess you guys haven't covered this yet, but I'm sure you will. Um, we basically, uh, one, passed, uh, you know, we, we, we did an initiative. We did an initiative um, and put it on the ballot and the citizens voted. We created this thing. And then two years later, the legislature, seeing the writing on the wall, turned, uh, created a, a law through the legislature and actually put it into the state constitution. That's what created the California Coastal Commission and, and the so-called Co California Coastal Act. One of the key aspects there is access, public access. And so one of our long-term ongoing battles are with communities such as Malibu, which very much so want you to think this is not your place. This is, this is not for you. Go down the road a little bit. Yeah, down over there is Zuma Beach. You should, you should go there. And they'll do fake painting. They'll do illegal street signing. They'll take down the signs that say this is a public access. It's, it's a massive long-term ongoing battle. Did you hear about some guy got sued like, in the millions blocking off like, access? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that was announced uh, in December, and and the, the and that was um, essentially for for denying the public access, for for blocking what should have been a public access way, um, and that uh, that was about a 18 year legal battle, and there, there was like there, there was announced two were announced at the same time. They totaled about 4.5 million in total fines, but they were two separate things. But um, yeah, totally, absolutely. So it's a real thing. We really do value this. So getting back to my story on North Carolina, so we're sitting there. And I'm saying, man, there's fences that go down the water. And they say, yeah, so this is so that people don't come onto our property. And I'm thinking, that kind of sucks. That's kind of a little bit uh, 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 arrogant. And then, and then when we talked about um, risk, which is something Dr. Patch is an expert in, I said, man, I can't believe it's a, maybe a, was it a two or three story house? These are maybe a two story, two and a half story house kind of thing. Again, right up the, the, the bottom floor of the patio was, you know, just straight up, maybe about two feet above the high tide line. I was thinking, man, this is crazy. Um, how do you guys keep the you know, storm from pushing sand in? And uh, m- my friend said, oh, that, that happens. I said, really? He said, oh, yeah, last time it happened was about three years ago. I said, three years ago, what happened? I said, sand filled up the entire first floor and much of the second floor. And I said, holy cow, that sucks. How did you fix it, FEMA money? So you guys paid to clean out his beach house? Or no, no, it wasn't his beach house, it was, it was his in-laws. But, but the point is, you guys paid to clean out his beach house. And I said, oh man, so you guys trying to sell it? They said, no, I don't think they're trying to sell it. I said, really, aren't, aren't you, wasn't it like a huge pain in the butt? So that was the third time in about 15 years that that happened. And every single time you guys are paying to clean out that second home. It, was, it wasn't their only home, that was, that was their beach home. So when we talk about coastal access, what we think of as coastal access changes markedly as we go around the country and as we go around the world. So that's a topic for later, that, that, that's just by way of introduction. But again, ease of access is a key thing. Are there roads, are there trails? How do we get to these different locations? Things like beach grooming, which is um, where we uh, go and we clean up the beach. So we typically drag some type of rake through the beach and pull out the, the stuff that's there. If there's baby diapers, if there's syringes, if there's stuff like that, of course, let's clean that up. Unfortunately, a lot of times that grooming also takes away some of the important components such as dead algae, dead rack that washes up that's really important to the insect community, the invertebrate community, and then in turn the, the birds and the fish and everybody else. So beach grooming is an important potential stressor that uh, our local governments are going to influence. Um, temporary access restrictions. So we see this mostly these days in terms of ecological concerns. So an endangered species, a bird that's nesting on the beach, and we put up a little, a little uh, uh, fence and say, hey, you guys don't go near the nest or something of that nature. Then we have things like recreational facilities, volleyball courts, uh, fire pits. Um, we might have a tower where, where a lifeguard is sitting in there to make sure that the kids don't drown, right? So, so all of those actions we take have an influence on the beach, and we're starting to realize all these things sum up to potentially a huge impact on the, the otherwise natural dynamics on these, um, on these situations. And the perception of this, the perception of the importance and the need to do these things is really uh, important. As far as Sandy Beach Ecology, has Dr. Patch gone over any of this yet? A little bit. Okay, so this is maybe this is just a little bit of review, but, but um, in, in a, just a, a minute or so here, the, the quick and, and dirty version is that we have the gross setting of the landscape. As you guys know, the sandy beach is between the ocean and the land. It's this, it's this transition zone. Um, and we have, we have that sort of land, sea, sea, land dynamic. And then we have the movement up and down the coast of sediment and particles and materials um, called littoral flow or littoral dynamics. And all those things together are going to determine what kind of sand is on the beach. Is it really coarse? Is it really sugary? Is it very, is it very shallow um, of a slope or is it a very steep slope? That kind of stuff. So that's sort of the gross abiotic setting, the gross physical setting for um, the location of our beach. The next thing we should talk about is how frequently these things are disturbed. Beaches are a classic system that has a bunch of disturbance. And so we can think about it in a bunch of different ways. We can think of it as a daily tide going up down. We can think of it as storms. We can think of it as seasonal movement of sand. But we have um, abiotic conditions setting the parameters of what might be there. 
then we have this disturbance going on. Historically, that disturbance has been natural. Increasingly, though, across the planet, that disturbance is driven by humans as we dump beach on the sand because we want to have more pretty looking sand, as we groom the beach, as we do all these different activities, we're a major driver and determiner of disturbance. Another really important thing to the ecology of sandy beaches worldwide is the amount of organic input. Since this, this area um, typically uh, doesn't have a lot of um, uh, it, it, it's, just, it's just a lot of sediment, a lot of sand, not a lot of organic matter. One of the key inputs of carbon or organic matter comes from um, dead things. It could come from dead plants that flop down the cliff. More typically, in our part of the world, it's coming from dead giant kelp individuals, big an algal individual, brown alga, that snaps off and then washes up ashore. And then as that, that algae begins to break down, it's a huge food source for a whole suite of critters. And that, that more food, the more critters, the more critters, the more diverse things that are there, the more diverse things that can eat them, and so forth. And then lastly, um, w one thing that we're seeing increasingly is this notion of newness, new things, things that have not existed in the past, or at least not existed in the past anywhere near the magnitude that they're existing now. And so that includes things like corvids. Those are, for the most part, from what we're talking about here, that's crows and ravens. Also includes scrub jays, but really crows and ravens especially. These are a, a class of animals that thrive around humans, that are nowhere near the abundance that they are in our cities, on the edges of our cities, um, compared to their natural abundances but they, they really do well. And they're voracious predators and omnivores. So they'll eat baby chicks, they'll attack fish, they'll, they'll have all kinds of ecological impacts. And then things like dogs. So everybody likes to take the dog to the beach, let your dog take your dog off the leash, run around, right? The bear's a bird's like, there's a bird, there's a bird, I'm gonna go get that bird. And then you go chase the bird and the bird's like, what, what the hell's that? And it freaks out and flies off his nest and then the bird's like, there's an egg, there's an egg, I'm gonna eat the egg, right? That kind of stuff. Horses, all those kind of things. Again, a dog every once in a while, no big deal. A, a, a crow every once in a while, no big deal. But we're seeing massive changes in the abundance of these potential stressors. And then lastly, things like marine debris, I'm sure you, Dr. Patch will talk about, or maybe Dr. Steele will give you guys a talk on, on some of our work on marine debris and microplastics. Okay, to give you one example of the kind of things that we're starting to get an insight to, what time, <laughs> what time do we go to, you guys? Okay. Um, are, are things like uh, this, so this guy, these are, these are some of our local sand crabs. There are, this genus is around the world, and we have, um, uh, this is by far the most abundant one we have here. We have about three that are, three different genera that are pretty common, but these are really um, important members of our community. And we can do all kinds of stuff with them. That's my son dissecting them. All you guys can dissect them. They're, they're not, they're, they're easy to catch and, and what have you. Um, but. Uh, we can use different elements of this ecosystem, elements like this, like these crabs, oops, what am I doing? These crabs that are easy to get, the birds. If you and I walk out there at three, maybe the birds have flown, right? Maybe the birds have, there's too many people on the beach, too many towels, too much you know, fake suntan lotion or whatever the heck it is, and they're like, I'm out of here, Poof, they're gone. So to sample the birds, we might have to come at a very specific time, whereas these guys, these guys are here at noon, they're here at one, they're here at midnight, relatively easy to grab. And so in this case, what we've done is on the, on the x-axis, this is the, um, the, and so my, what my son's doing here is cutting these open and looking for these little parasites inside these guys. Um, that sounds gross and whatever, but it's actually not. It's very easy to do. They look like little rice grains. They can't hurt you, so they pose no threat to you. So really easy to cut open, crack open, check them out, bang, count them really quickly. We have school kids doing this around the world. Uh, retired folks doing it, you guys doing it, it's very easy. Um, and so crack it open, let's, let's count how many parasites are in there. And so that, the number of parasites, and this is just a small set of the data to illustrate this, but the number of parasites are on the bottom axis. Um, it's actually the prevalence of parasites for each population. Um, uh, the average amount, but then on, and then on this axis, this is the um, monthly average from January to May when we're having um, our shorebirds, the, the peak abundance of our shorebirds, how often do we see 
um, a couple of specific bird species. And it turns out, if we just look at the parasites, that correlates with the number, with, with the abundance of these birds that we have. So we, you can go out and count the birds, and that's really cool, and that tells us something important. Maybe we don't have the time to go out for five months to count the birds. Instead, if we only had two hours or an hour at the beach, we can go out, grab these crabs, crack them open. And because this is, this is, this is an ecosystem, people don't recognize that, but it, it is an ecosystem, these, the abundance of one critter is related to the abundance of another critter. And so that's what we're seeing here. So you can get ideas like that. Um, and we can, we can uh, yeah, we don't need to go into this. But basically, we can tell about the diversity of the bird community from the parasites. We can also come to these beaches with different perspectives. So that is maybe more a traditional ecological way to think about characterizing our sandy beaches. We can also use some of the tools that um, we're increasingly using, and some of you guys have been helping us with this. And these are uh, some of our underwater robots and flying robots. And if you guys are interested in that, you should talk to Dr. Patch or come by our Friday uh, lab meetings. Um, but these are some shots that Chase actually took, um, just to, to give you a sense of um, we're so often used to being stuck to the ground and we think of everything as, as from our, our perspective of looking across, but these tools are giving us a new insight into these systems. And so in this case, we're looking uh, north slash westward. Where's this, is this Channel Islands Harbor? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. So, so, right, so from this perspective, we can start to see it's not a flat sandy beach, right? We, get, we have some topography here. There's, there's this up-downness going on. This is a, a look straight down. And we can start to see one of the most important components of our sandy beaches, which we never seem to talk about, and that is what's on the, on the end, what's, what, what's, what's the backside of the sandy beach. So we typically think of the sandy beach as being this, and that's an important part of the sandy beach. But actually, um, some of our colleagues were coming to a possibly a new consensus that one of the key determiners of the condition, the health, the, the dynamics of the beach is what's going on back here. Do we have a sand dune community as we historically did? Or do we have a paved parking lot? Do we have a dune complex or do we have a bunch of homes? That kind of stuff. So we can use these tools to really uh, easily and really quickly uh, map these communities. And we can look at the different vegetation, et cetera. Um, and has, has Dr. Patch talked to you guys about this stuff yet? Okay, I'll just show you guys one example. So this is, so some of you guys in here are doing this for your capstone and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's really, really cool. Um, I would encourage all you guys to consider, whether you're an ESRM major or not, consider taking our intro to GIS class. GIS, which is making maps, is actually gonna become, is becoming a fundamental skill. Just like being able to work basic Excel and do, and do Word, Right? You don't have to be the, some crazy programmer and spend your life in there. You can if you want. But it really is starting to become a foundational skill. And, uh, and, and I would argue that, that the use of some of these robots that are increasingly cheap and off the shelf is something that you guys can um, learn about. And so just to show, so this is, this is a bunch of pictures that uh, probably Chase there has flown. Look down, so basically a bunch of pictures like this, picture, picture, picture. And then we have a program that does the math that overlays pictures, creates a three-dimensional model, and then takes those pictures and re-stretches those pictures back over the, the image. And so you get something like this. So this, this is a three-dimensional model, and it looks like this. So th these, are, these are just two-dimensional pictures that we've created a three-dimensional map, stretched it, right, or, or created a topology, and then stretched it back over. So it's just like having a Google Earth uh, of this area, but it's one that you guys create. And we can do things like count the number of birds on the beach. We can count the, we can measure the amount of uh, sand that's there, how much has been dumped, how much is eroded, all that kind of cool stuff. And, uh, and it's, it's really cool. It's very simple. It's increasingly every few months, it's more and more turnkey, even though we have problems with some of the, uh, the free apps to fly, to fly these things. But um, very powerful technology. Traditionally, people have thought Beaches are too hard to map. It's easy to map uh, areas that, that are really, really different, but these areas with subtle differences have been really hard. Now we can. So if you guys are interested in that, um, there's some really neat things that we're working on. And, and, and apparently, uh, not apparently, but what's actually starting to turn out is the shape of these beaches really, really helps us understand the birds that are there, um, the value to people for recreation, all that kind of stuff. Okay. 
Um, what are some of the values of, of doing beach monitoring? We're going to talk about some of our poll results in a sec, but um, there's Chase right there and Paul, one of our former technicians. So um, by going out and studying the beach, that's something pe sometimes people think, oh, this is, this is not that interesting a subject. What, who cares? We were actually the first team out right after the refugio spill happened two summers ago. And so this is, this is some of our crew out at um, El Capitan State Beach, just as it was being closed down, they allowed us to stay in because we were like scientists, dudes. So we could stay in. And in the back, these are people looking for dead birds. And the oil spills started just a, a, about a mile or so up here. And the oil was getting ready to dump on the beach. So we were able to use our data to look at the condition of the beach before the oil hit, after the oil hit, and then post spill to sort of see what the impact of the oil spill was. What, there you go, yeah, see, ah, uh, right? So, so this sucks to see dead animals, dead critters, like this dolphin, like this sea lion. This is what gets the attention. And so this is what all the reporters wanted to ask us about. So how many dead sea lions, how many porpoises, how many dolphins, how many this, how many that? Um, and you know that sucks and all, and that's what people want to hear, but really the big story, as with so much of our ecosystem and so much of our environmental stress, is actually the, the less sexy guys, the smaller guys. And so that's what's going on here. So those sand crabs I was just showing you, these are dead sand crabs. You never ever see adult dead, you might see the, the molt, the, the skeleton cast off, but you never see adult dead sand crabs. These guys are dead in the tar line. So we saw um, that frequently in the wake of the refugio spill. Not only were these sand crabs impacted, but other things like our grunion, uh, one of our important fish that only exists basically here in Southern California from Northern Baja to basically up to point, uh, up to, well, now, because of climate change, they're getting up as far north as Monterey. But um, these are the eggs. These guys come up at night, go up high on the beach, waddle, waddle, waddle a hole, put their eggs out, flop back down in the water, and their eggs hang out for a, a lunar cycle. And then when the tides come back high again, then the eggs turn to little baby fish and they float out to sea. This stuff, the, the sand crabs, the um, grunion, these fish, totally impacted by this tarring that happened up and down the coast. Um, I, don't, I don't want to talk about tar forever. I, I'll, I'll talk about oil spills forever if you let me. But um, so this is, this is an example. This is near downtown Ventura. So we had some areas that were relatively clean with oil, some areas that were inches thick with oil, up and down, all the way from Santa Barbara down to Los Angeles. And um, again, don't want to talk about oil spills, but suffice it to say that um, uh, there was very, the, the information transfer rate was very poor, right? So our, our government response that, that's working for you guys to clean this up in your, in your name and for us weren't really clear in coming out with information. So it turns out we had to go out and measure the oil ourselves at all of our different beaches. And that's what, and that's what we did. Um, and then we actually did some experiments where we took basically some of our critters and expose them to different amounts of tar like they would be. And so in this case, these guys are in relatively clean seawater. This is a little more, a little more, a little more. And what you see is, I don't need to show you any, any pictures, I mean, any uh, graphs, I'm gonna show you the pictures. So here's a clean, here's the little baby, little, little eggs from the sand crabs. And these are guys that are, that are you know, living on the sandy beach, living in the sandy beach. And here these guys are after uh, about nine days of exposure to this tar and they're developing normally. These are eye spots. These are starting to grow eyes, starting to become little little crabs. That's all cool. These guys suck. You don't see eye spots. Basically, these guys are deformed and either, either will grow up deformed or will die. So clear impact to the sandy beach, even though you know, someone comes in, they clean up the tar and they go, we're all good. We're, you know, we're good. Let's, let's, nothing to see here. Um, the other thing that we do, and that's what this is the main thing I was going to talk to you guys about today, if I ever get to it, um, is this notion of uh, diverse approaches to understanding these systems. So we can do that with our drones, but we can also do it with other um, ways of, of gathering information. So I would say our interdisciplinary approaches that we try to focus on here at CSUCI are perfect for understanding the sandy beaches. Here's one example, and then we'll start talking about our wider surveying to get a sense of what people think. Um, this is, uh, okay, so, okay, so we had, we had, we had all, different beaches. Now check it out. Normally when you have an oil spill, here's the oil spill. Let's say it starts here and there's tons of oil and there's a little bit less oil and a little bit less oil and a little bit less oil. That's not how this oil spill happened. How the refugio spill happened is a big dollop of oil went out to sea 
and then <laughs> chilled and kind of burbled and 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 got entrained in gyres and this and that. So then all of a sudden it was wug, 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 dollop, boom. Then an area got hit with oil. And then wug, 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 boom, another area got hit with oil. So it wasn't spatially autocorrelated. It wasn't, it wasn't the impact area and then less and less and less. It was, it was by and large unrelated to distance from the, um, from the event. So that's cool. So that, that isolates this. So then we did was all this work that we did measuring how much tar on all our beaches. We created a score going from the sandy beach had no oil, zero, up to the sandy beach had six. That was basically um, very few beaches were that. That was the, the beaches right basically where the Fukio itself and El Capitan. What this is, is this is some of our, our survey data from people on the beach. We surveyed 33 different beaches up and down the coast. And um, so we noted the score on that particular beach. And then we said, hey, how far did you drive to get to the beach today for the people we encounter on the beach? And so what you see is there's no, so this is a, a mean and standard error, the error bar here. And don't need to do statistics. I'll tell you the answer. The answer is it didn't matter. People drove the same distance on average if it was a relatively clean beach or if it was a, a little bit oiled beach or if it was a heavily oiled beach. So people, so driving wasn't affected. But how much money they spent was totally affected by how oiled it was. So when you ask them how much money they spent in the last week at the beach, at or near the beach, or if they just arrived at the beach today, how much money they were planning on spending over the, the coming week, this is what you get. You get, um, when we, we have heavily oiled beaches, people came to them, but then they got there and they went, this sucks. I'm gonna go somewhere else, right? I'm gonna go watch a movie, I'm gonna go, gonna go hike in the mountains, I'm gonna go whatever. So this disappeared really quickly after the oil spill, and we could talk about why if you guys want. And we'll just start talking about our a public opinion polls. So this is something that, again, you guys have helped, some of you guys have helped us out with. Those of you that will take our coastal class will, will help out with this. I started doing this in 1999, and at my previous institution at UCLA, and then I, I continued it where I was a postdoc and researcher, and then brought it here, and we started doing this in 2005. So we've basically been doing this since 2005, although really rigorously since 2007. So this is something you guys do. We survey people every fall, uh, generally late September to October. We survey people face to face. We survey people in Los Angeles, Ventura, and Santa Barbara County. And, and it varies each year depending on what's going on, but typically it's somewhere between about 1,000 and 1,500 people. So it's a lot of people that we survey. Um, we have a core set of questions that we ask every year, and then some change based on what you guys are interested in or something that happens in the news, maybe an oil spill, maybe a nuclear accident, something like that. Um, and we ask people just what do they think about these coastal issues? Do they, do they go to the beach a lot? Do they not go to the beach a lot? Et cetera. Um, and then we have some rules there about, about uh, uh, how many, and we, 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 we sample people in public locations. So that last survey I, to, I told you about, we were sampling people at the beach. We maybe sample some people at the beach here, but this is people not necessarily at the beach. This is people at the mall, people at Starbucks, people at a car wash, wherever. Um, and uh, the short version is it, we do pretty well in terms of sampling our population, uh, our survey population compared to the, the populations of our counties, but we are a little bit different. So on average, we tend to sample. So the average census data for, our, for, for this region is about 20 to 24 years of age. Our means, means poll taker is about 36. We tend to be a little bit over enriched in college degrees. On average, we're about 30%. <laughs> Our, our sample population is about 37%, and people say they vote more regularly than the average person. Other than that, everything else is indistinguishable from the wider population. Okay, so having said that, um, the questions are broken down into different categories. Um, you know, how do you feel about this? Some, some ask, what have you done? W what is your behavior? Others say, what do you think about this thing? And so without going further, we're gonna take a quick pause, and I have an activity for you guys to do. How exciting, how interactive. What an incredible teacher I must be to do this. So um, pass these guys out, everybody grab one. And, um, and let me just explain what you're gonna do. So there's a bunch of, there's several questions here. So I want you guys to think about this for a minute. Jot down your answers. Now most of these things have a question. For example, the first one is, is climate change a significant problem? Yes or no? 
And so we, we ask people, they can say, it is, it isn't, or, or I don't know. And so I'd like you guys to guess what you think the percentage of people that, that responded to each of these ways. So there's, there's yes, no, and unsure. On the second line, there's this thing that says how much money, so I have the mean and standard error, you guys probably don't care about the standard error, but you can guess the average amount of money that people say they've spent at the coast, and we define the coast as within 10 miles of the coast, so at the beach or really near the beach, how much money they've spent over the previous seven days. The next one is how old was the average person when they first went to the beach? Um, and then, and then the, the question below that is, is what proportion of people say they go to the beach daily, weekly, monthly, etc.? <coughs> and then the last thing on the bottom is preference. So I probably should wait for everybody to have these, sorry. The last thing on the bottom is preference. So the last thing on the bottom, people are, we're, we're giving them a choice. So for example, um, it says, uh, with your ideal, be you know, close your eye, close your eyes, and think of your most perfect, bestest, most awesomest beach you'd love to go check out. Okay, so then that beach, your 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 personal ideal beach, are there few people or lots of people, right? So that was the choice people picked. So they had to pick A or B. And then, is the sand really sugary? Is it really sugary sand everywhere, or is it more rocky? So that last question on the bottom, pick an A or B. So for these things, I'd like you guys to put down what you think the proportion of the population that we survey, again, we're talking about people from LA County, uh, Ventura County, Santa Barbara County. What you think, uh, so make your, make your guesses, and we'll talk about the results. So we'll take a minute, you guys, you guys take a whack at that. Okay, all right, cool. All right, were you, were you guys in general agreement with each other? Yes. Which groups are more or less pretty much similar? Oh, most people. Or which people were radically different? It's okay. We still like you. So we're just curious. Nobody's copying to being totally different. Interesting. How many people were, were sort of different? Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is the data from our most recent survey. Again, we've been doing this for for over a decade, but this is just the data from this lot from, uh, you know, whatever, four months ago, four or five months ago. So 2016 data. Was it in the same questions? Uh, th mm, these, yes, or, or almost all these. We started asking how much people spent about, mm, I don't know, three years or so ago, age at first beach, about the same. And then the ones about uh, question 33, that we added about two years ago. But, but almost the vast majority of the questions, yes, are asked from year to year to year. But as we discover new things research-wise and they become interesting, we, we tend to add things in. Um, but generally speaking, yes. So for example, the climate change one, this first question we've asked every single uh, year. Okay, so what do you guys think? How many people thought that climate change is a significant problem? Yeah. Oh, sorry. What, what proportion were you guys thinking? 60. 60? Somebody else said 80? Yeah. Okay, so 78%. These are in percentages. 78%, 10% said no, and 12% said sure. So the roundings here are a little bit, they might get a little funky because we're just going to whole numbers. But so, so 78% of, and, and it, it fluctuates, it goes up a little bit, a little down each year, depending if it's election year or something like that. But by and large, this is, this is it's pretty close to this, and it's been consistent. Indeed, when we look at the national polling, for example, with people's attitudes towards climate change, when the national polling kind of dips up a few, or it goes up a few percentages or go it goes down, ours shows the same thing. So we see the same phenomenon. Um, the takeaway from this is the vast majority of people, at least in our communities, believe this is a real thing that we should deal with, right? So sometimes when you watch the news, you, that maybe it doesn't appear to be what you're hearing, but that's the reality. Okay, cool. How about um, what proportion of people you think have avoided going to beaches because they were uh, uncomfortable or didn't feel safe or whatever? 10, 30. 30. Any other guesses? I would say 45. 45, snap. 14%. 14%, 70% people say they never have, and 17 people are unsure. So that, that's, that's interesting, right? So that's that 14%, I think most of us, as, as this showed, the vast majority of people don't, don't, aren't intimidated. But certain people, be they from a different uh, 
you know, section of our society or be they going to a beach where maybe it doesn't feel welcoming. Well, the classic example is Lanuda Bay. Does anybody know where that is? Palos Verdes Peninsula. There's this gang, basically, of surfers called, yeah, I know it sounds funny, but it's true, uh, <laughs> um, where these guys essentially, if anybody came, to, came down to their beach, they would throw rocks at you, they would slash your tires, they would kick your butt. I mean, really, really bad. So finally, the cops finally did something after about 20 years, just this past year, and, and kicked them out and arrested them and, and, and prosecuted folks. But, but so we do have communities that, again, try to either intentionally or unintentionally make, make certain people not feel comfortable. But thankfully, it's a relatively small proportion of people. Um, okay, and then people said, so now compared to 50 years ago, is, is the ocean... You know, is our ocean coastal system healthier or less? What'd you guys think? How many people thought it was healthier? 60, 40? 40? 40. Yeah. 40? Oops, snap. 20%. And 46% said no. And then the rest were unsure. So check that out. So only about one in five people thinks, thinks things have gotten better. Um, and that's going to depend on your metric, but many things. So when my when my in-laws and relatives used to surf in Santa Monica Bay, there used to be turds floating up in their face in the 60s, right? I'm not talking about 100, 200 years ago, right? The water was horrible. I, I have some accounts of, of a lifeguard jumping in the water in Santa Monica Bay in 1930 to save a person, got some, got some water in his mouth, got typhoid the next day. So... So in certain metrics like gross water quality, we've done a fantastic job. We have, we, we have problems still. We have a ways to go. But it's interesting how, uh, what, what elements of the coast we choose to focus on. Is it healthy or not? But that's important because this is going to go. If, if, if almost half of the people think that things have not gotten better, that's going to have implications for are we going to fund certain things? Are we not going to fund certain things? Are we get, uh, is the government capable of responding? Is, is, our, is our culture capable of responding or not? OK, how about this? How much, how much money on average do you think people are spending um, at or near the beach? 500. 500? What's that? Oh, I was going to say 30.95. 30.95. Do I hear? It's like, it's like we're doing an auction or something. <laughs> Anybody, any other guess? We got 500. We got 30-ish, 500-ish. 250, 10 bucks. 405 on average. But the standard deviation is 2,200 something. So there's a, there's a huge variation, right? So some people, that's telling us that some people are spending thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. Other people are not. Now, this, 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 is, this is probably mostly how we structured our question because, you know, uh, uh, where people, a lot of people think of, well, they pay for parking, they pay for gas. Maybe they aren't thinking if they live right next to the coast, their rent, their bills. So, so there's problems with this question, but, it, but at least as a, as a basic yardstick, it's saying these folks that are at the, or near the beach are spending hundreds of dollars every week. Yeah. Yeah, so we say, how much money do you spend? I mean, Really, we should do a survey just on this. This is just one question of many, but again, I, I don't, I don't, the real answer is not $405, I guarantee. But, but that's, it's a nice rubric so we can go from year to year and see, is it generally going up? Is it generally going down? That kind of thing. Um, okay, cool. How about uh, age? Oh, I didn't write this one down. Oh my gosh. Uh, how old were people when they first went to the beach? What do you guys think? Oh, the, the average age. What were, you, what were you guys' guesses? Nine. Nine? Fifteen? Seven. No, less than two. Less than two. Any other ones? Three. Zero. Three. Zero. Ah, we, we definitely have people saying zero. So the average is 4.7 years. And the standard deviation is only about 5.4. So, so a much tighter distribution. So, so yeah, there were, so you guys say nine? Yeah, nine is within, you know, one standard deviation. That, that's pretty close. But a lot of people are going at about four. But also remember that standard deviation also goes down. So if a large number of folks are also going at zero, going at one, going at two. So this, this is indicative of the fact that this is an important element of our culture, right? That people, even when they can't really walk or are barely walking or whatever, it's a place that 
for example, mom and dad might want to take you, that, that, that they want to share that space with you and engage with you in that, in that particular place. Maybe you're swimming, maybe you're building sandcastles, maybe you're whatever, changing your diapers, but it's all, it's all cool. Okay, this one. Uh, so I'm going to give you guys the raw percentages and then we'll sum them up. So, so what would you guys say, what was the most common, of, you know, people go to the beach daily, weekly, monthly, which of these categories do you think is the most, is the, whatever your percentages were, which one was the highest percentage you think? What was the most popular? Monthly? Weekly? A few times a year? Okay, so here's the, here's the raw percentages. Where am I? Did I write that down? Here's the raw percentages, okay. 13%, 27%, 27%, this is rounded, right? So technically monthly wins by, by a, a, few, a few dozen respondents. Uh, 27, 27, uh, what am I, 21, seven, and seven. 21, seven, and seven. So monthly actually wins, but it's really tightly associated with weekly. But I would say one of the most interesting things is 13% of our population is going to the beach every day or, or close to every day, right? That's a lot of going to beaches, right? Maybe they're surfing, maybe they're exercising, maybe they're fishing, but, but they're going and using this resource, right? And so then what I'm gonna do here is doing what's called a running mean, which is we're gonna add daily to weekly and then take that and add that to monthly, okay? So this becomes 40, this becomes 67, this becomes 88, this becomes 95, and this becomes 100. It actually rounds to a little bit higher than 100 because of the rounding issue. But, but check that out. What that's saying is 40% of our population goes to the beach at least weekly, if not more frequently. How surprising the beaches are super important to us here in Southern California. Um, if we talk about monthly, two-thirds of our population go to the beach at least monthly. That's crazy, right? Yeah. Do you have any idea that uh, the percentage of Californians that are employed at the beach? Ooh. Uh, we do ask a question um, that I don't, I don't have here, but we do ask a, a question which is, um, uh, we don't always ask it every year, but we sometimes ask, uh, what's your occupation? And so we, we can get at that a little teeny bit when people say something like, I'm a lifeguard or things. So we can get um, the lower, you know, the minimum number, at least X percentage are associated with that. Um, but we don't, we don't ask that every single year. But that's a great, that'd be a great question to ask. Cool. So check it out. So um, essentially everybody, 95%, um, go at least yearly. So even if you have maybe you're in a wheelchair or you have some, some business that keeps you flying around the world, you're still probably going at least once a year, if not more frequently. Cool? So I would say that one of the most interesting things we found is 40% of our population go to, goes to the beach at least weekly and two thirds go at least monthly. That's that tells us we're a beach dwelling people. Okay, number next, which is, uh, what do people prefer? So, so okay, so this first one. Um, now, uh, where, my, where are my numbers? Where are my numbers? Where are my numbers? Okay, so now this one, these guys don't necessarily always sum to 100 because sometimes people don't answer the question and they answer other questions. So, so because of some variance in how people respond, it's not, it doesn't always sum to 100. But, um, but what do you guys think? Uh, Few people, or uh, uh, do people prefer beaches with few people or beaches with lots of people? Few. Few? Yeah, right. So it's 71% to 26%. So a huge difference, right? Very, very clear that people on average prefer to have relatively empty beaches. But, but a subset of our society, about one fourth of us, actually prefer to go to beaches where there's tons of folks. Maybe we like to go with our families, right? Maybe we like to go to the beach and do barbecues. Maybe we like to go to places where there's amenities like, like Santa Monica Pier or something like that. So most, 
Most prefer a few, but, but there's a significant component that, that uh, like the other. Okay, what do you guys think? Sugary sand or more rocky beach? What do you guys think people prefer? Yeah, right. 68% to 30%. So sugar wins. So few, we'll do, let's do that. We'll do this. We'll make boom, few, and sugar, boom. Okay, parking. Do you think people. <laughs> um, so, so. Yeah. Okay. Well, this is kind of a lame question, but whatever. Yeah. So, so this this is this is do people like free parking, or or places where there's none? And the answer is eighty one percent, and was it sixteen percent? So most people like would would like lots of free parking. Surprise, surprise. Um, okay. Animals. Do people like uh, a beach where there's no animals around, or there's lots of wildlife around? Fifty fifty. Some people say uh, lots of animals. Any other thoughts? Okay. So the answer is 23% to 74%. So most people like lots of animals around. Sea lions, birds, whatever those, whatever those critters have to be. Dogs. Dogs. Do people like beaches where there's no dogs at all or there's just tons of dogs running around off leash doing all their doggy things? Lots of dogs? No dogs? Ooh, we're divided. We're, 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 we're a nation divided. Just like our, our nation. Okay, so the answer is 38% uh, say no, and 58% say, uh, so about 40 to 60. So much closer, right? Much closer than some of these other categories. So clearly we have a lot of dog lovers, but on average, uh, on average, the people that prefer, uh, or sorry, yeah, so we have a lot of dog lovers, and on average, people prefer there to be just dogs doing their doggy thing, running around. Dogs, dogs. Okay, grooming. So grooming, this is again, the raking, the cleaning of the beach, removing, removing um, natural things like kelp, but also garbage and trash. So uh, this is 37%, what do we do on time? 37% to 60%. So, so people, prefer, people prefer it to be non-groomed. So most people, although it's pretty close, right? It's about, about 40 to 60. But if we had a pick, we'd say people tend to prefer it to be more, more messy, more stuff around. And this is, this is going to vary. Yeah. How much, how much like, education do you provide? None. None. Sure. Sure, right. Yeah, so, that, so that, 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 that's clearly a possibility. So people are, aren't sure. With this. So, so people can leave these blank as well. So what usually happens, people, so that's why these, typically that's why these things don't sum to 100. So people are like, I don't know, and they just leave it. They, they, don't, they don't express a preference. So, but you're right. You know, to do this properly, we would show them pictures. How about beach A? What about beach B? Okay, cool. What about beach C? What about beach D? And that'd be an awesome project. If you guys are thinking about a capstone, that'd be a killer project. But we just don't have, we don't have the time to do that because that, that requires much more printing and more, more aggressive stuff. But that would be an awesome project. Um, but the, the short version is we ask these questions because this is how we categorize our beaches. We do our beach health assessment. And, and so this is, this is helping us understand. So we have all these measurements of how many beaches are groomed, how many aren't. But in terms of our valuation of them, in terms of understanding what is our society like, is our society like a groomed beach? Do they not? This is, this is essentially why we started asking these questions. So we could, we could have a sense of what's going on. But you're right. It's going to depend. Uh, the people, you know, maybe that's somebody living in, uh, I don't know, northern Santa Barbara coast where, where, the, where the stuff on the beach is mostly algae, right? Versus if we're asking this in downtown or, or in Santa Monica where it's highly urbanized and there's thousands and thousands of people going to the beach every day and most of the stuff is garbage. They're probably going to say, oh, I don't want, you know, I want, it, I want it groomed. So totally right. The neat thing is, and we, have, we haven't gone into all this whole poll, but, um, but we actually ask people zip code, which they can volunteer. So we don't take any other identifying information. We can't figure out what street they're from or something like that we don't want to. But at least we can grossly figure out, oh, these people are from Santa Monica. These people are from Santa Barbara. And you can actually do that analysis. You can actually say, hey, if somebody is from a beach that is maybe in a more urbanized area that tends to have more trash, do they tend to 
like it groomed or not. And that, that's I'd be an awesome research product. If you guys want to work on this data set? We have this massive data set. We need people to analyze it. So you guys can come talk to me later. Um, okay, then the view. So when we look at when we look at the beach, is it stretched from horizon to horizon or is it a little teeny cove? Is it a little teeny? You guys so you guys say horizon, horizon? Yep, that's basically right. So 59% say they like it stretching from horizon to horizon, and 38% of people say it is uh, in, the, in uh, a little pocket cove, a little, little hidden cove, like a Malibu somewhere or something. Okay, concessions. So I, yeah, sorry, concess. I maybe should have, sorry. That, that, that was concessions. Do you like being, do you like having concessions around? And the idea is lots of concessions, lots of hot dog stands, lots of places to rent umbrellas, things like that, or, you know, none of those. 50-50? 44 to 52. So pretty evenly split. So some people really like that stuff, other people don't, right? And that's another wonderful thing about our coast is that you can pick, right? If you wanna go sort of do the bourgeois thing and hang out and drink, uh, and get drunk at the beach with super nice bathrooms, you can go to Paradise Cove, right? If you want to go somewhere and hide and nestle behind the sand dunes, you can go to Ormond, right? If you want somewhere where there's tons of people with lots of dogs, you can go to one of those beaches. If you want somewhere where it's really hard to get down the cliff and people don't take their dogs, you can do that. So we're actually blessed with this huge diversity of sandy beaches, even in our little just nearby neighborhoods. Okay, uh, almost out of time. So kids, so kids, what do you, uh, lots of kids or few kids? What do you guys think? Few. Few. 39, what are you college kids? What's going on with your statements there? Okay, so few win. Uh, and then surf, lots of, lots of good surf breaks or gentle? 50-50 is, is people are saying, the answer is 53 to 43. So pretty, pretty evenly split, but, but a few more uh, better surf conditions went out. Um, walking, now getting down to the beach, do we like it easy, just park the car and just kind of, you know, Walk on in or got to go down a steep cliff? Cliff. Ooh, cliff. Interesting. No, it's easy. One of, the, one of the clearest differences. People like an easy walk to 22%. So people really like an easy access to the beach. And then lastly, do you like to see a lot of people fishing or nobody fishing? No. Nobody fishing. Interesting. You guys don't like to fish. 41% to 56%. So there we go. All right, cool. Awesome possum. I have so much more to talk about. <laughs> I have all the data to go through with you guys, but obviously I've classically poorly planned. So uh, I just have to come back and show you guys the full results. But I think we, we end at 115, right? Yeah. Okay, so, so there we go. So that's that. So, so why don't you guys save that? I'll, I'll pass this on to Dr. Patch, and maybe I can come back in a week or a couple weeks and we can sort of finish this up, finish up this conversation. But um, out of time, uh, hope that was interesting. <laughs> uh, I, I would strongly suggest you guys save these things and as you're going through your discussions over the semester you can refer back to this you know so this is what our real local folks are thinking this isn't what some theoretician is telling you this is what our people think thanks you guys see you next time Dr. Patch will be back for next class